Good morning. Great to be with you all this morning. My name is Eric Vogt. I'm one of the pastors here, and I am so glad to welcome you this morning um, to St. Paul's United Methodist Church, uh, where we are working to um, love God and all others unconditionally and seek answers to our questions and serve God by serving others. And we hope that everything we do uh, leads us into that, um, into that work of, of loving and seeking and serving like Jesus. And um, I'm thankful to be on the journey in that with all of you. I uh, wanted to draw your attention. Lots of things happening around the life of the church um, this morning as we are halfway through our Lent journey. Um, uh, so th there's lots going on, uh, particularly next Sunday. In a little bit, you'll hear from Pat Cooper about um, our relationship with Dialogue Institute, uh, who are um, mostly Turkish Muslims. Uh, that we have a regular relationship with, but one of the things we like to do is a, a Ramadan uh, fast-breaking meal that we'll have here um, next Sunday. So you'll hear a bit more about that in a minute. The other thing that's happening next Sunday that I'm excited about, that Love Team is kind of sponsoring, um, Kirk Yeager uh, on that team, uh, we are going to have a March Madness Bracket Challenge. And so I hope you're ready. I hope you're filling out, you're looking to fill out your brackets with the conference tournaments this week. Uh, the brackets will be announced next Sunday. Uh, and that you can join in our like league uh, to submit both your men's and women's brackets and we will keep track and have fun and um, have a prize for, for our winners of the men's and women's brackets. So look for that. Uh, the other thing that's happening, you might have noticed on the welcome table out there, um, that we are looking to uh, adopt some of the planter pots that we have outside. And so um, you can grab one of those, they're, they're numbered, I guess, and um, Kent Gard has put that together for us, and you can, um, you can check that out out there uh, to help us um, keep the place looking nice. Uh, lots happening in the life of our kids and youth. Um, our our um, pastor for children and families, uh, Jessica Richard, and is planning to be back next Sunday, which is exciting. Uh, it'll be great to have her back from maternity leave and welcome a new little one into our congregation. Um, uh, along with that, uh, some times will be changing next Sunday afternoon uh, because of the Ramadan dinner, so keep an eye out for that. Um, we will have a, on March 24th is Palm Sunday, which is always a great day with kids here. Uh, we'll have a special open house um, for uh, parents and uh, parents of kids up to sixth grade will we'll be downstairs and encourage you to meet teachers and kind of see the lay of the land and, and what's going on. And so we wanted to do to do that to give parents a chance to, to be with the teachers that we have uh, for Kids Connection on Sunday morning. Um, that will be on, on Palm Sunday at 10 a.m. We'll have our egg hunt for Easter. You saw we're collecting candy out there. And then we'll have third grade Bibles. If you um, have or love a third grader, uh, in your life for someone who hasn't gotten a Bible in the last couple years, uh, they, so they could be like fourth grade, um, we'd love to, to have them with us. So uh, let us know if that's something that, um, if you have one of those people, uh, let's talk. So today we're continuing in our series, uh, looking at uh, our discipleship pathway, these habits and practices that help us to grow in loving and seeking and serving, these tools uh, that we exercise with together. And uh, today, Pastor Kyle will be talking about joining a small group and the importance of community, uh, of having a, a group of people, a few uh, traveling companions uh, on this pathway. And so I'm uh, looking forward to all that God has for us um, to, to hear and, and to do uh, as we hear from God through Pastor Kyle's message in the scriptures today. So again, thanks for being here. Fill out those attendance pads uh, if you haven't yet. And um, we're just excited to have you and, and to get connected together in following Jesus. I'm going to invite you to stand and worship with us this morning.
God in a time of prayer, I want to remind you that um, each week we're collecting our prayer requests and um, we send out an email on Thursdays. If you're not getting that email, do let me know. Um, and uh, please feel free to turn in your prayer requests either today or by email to me. 
Let's go to God together. All loving and ever living God. We give you thanks that you woke us up this morning and gave us life and breath from you. You gave us purpose and community. God, we come in this time to recenter ourselves with you in your way. And God, we recognize ways we've fallen short and separated ourselves from you and others. God, we need your help. And so, in asking you to come and center us and make us anew, God, we come confessing And you are the source of everything that makes life possible. You're the giver of everything that makes life good. So we gather and we to, to give our thanks, but we confess that we've often failed to live our thankfulness. What we have, we take for granted, and we grumble about what we lack. We've squandered your bounty with little thought of those who will come after us. We're more troubled by the few who have more than by the many who have less. Forgive us, O oh God. Teach us once again to make gratitude and sharing and connection our way of life by your grace. God, we also come recognizing that there are many hurting uh, in our midst. God, we confess that Sometimes we have not done all we could to be your hands and feet and voice. God, we do pray for those who are sick and at home who would like to be here and can't this morning. We pray for those who are mourning. Thank you that you carry our grief and you know what it is to lament. You suffer alongside us. God, we thank you that uh, even in the midst of trouble and challenge, so many have stepped up to be advocates. God, with International Women's Day yesterday, we remember all that many women and, and, and allies have done to advance uh, gender equality, and we recognize that there's still much work to do. Help us, O oh God. God, where there is violence and tension in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our cities and around the world, God, bring your peace. Again, we're in need, God, and we can't manufacture all this on our own. So by your spirit, guide us and lead us and fill us up. Help us to be all we are created to be, to come alongside all of creation and being all that you created create all of creation to be, to be yours, belonging to you and one another, singing in your praise. God, thanks for the opportunity to pray and to praise together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, at this time, um, you know, each week we've been wanting to highlight something around the life of the church, and Pat Cooper is going to come forward. Uh, like I mentioned at the top, to talk a little bit about our relationship with Dialogue Institute and a special annual event that we like to do with them. Um, uh, called an iftar, and Pat will tell you more. Hi. I wanted to uh, invite all of you to a really exciting evening next week uh, with the Dialogue Institute. They've been one of our partners uh, for probably at least eight years. We've supported them with part of our offering and with our activities um, that we've done with them. Uh, they have a great mission, a great goal, and I thought I'd tell you a little bit about that because some of you probably don't know about the Dialogue Institute at all. Um, so they started right after 9-11 at a time when there was a lot of fear and distrust of Muslims in the United States. It was started, the organization was started by some Turkish Americans and uh, their friends who decided that something needed to be done about that distrust and fear. 
So what they did was work together to make an organization that's basically educational um, and service oriented, but they were trying to solve the question as how can citizens of the world of many diverse cultures live together in peace and harmony and not be afraid of each other, not war against each other. Um, so to do this, they, um, they're called the Dialogue Institute because they created some activities where people could get together and dialogue or talk. Um, a lot of times this had to do with food um, because you, know, you can't break bread with your enemy once you talk to them and sit down and eat with them, um, your friends. At least that's kind of the goal that they were working toward. So that's how I first met the Dialogue Institute people. I was invited to a cooking class. And I have to admit that before I went to that cooking class, I, I really only, I had never met a Muslim. And I only had those stereotypes in my background that I saw on television and I heard people talk about. So I was a little uneasy, I was out of my comfort zone. But when I met them and uh, talked with them, I learned that the people in the Dialogue Institute were some of the most caring, loving, spiritual people that I had ever met. In fact, they made me feel ashamed that I wasn't living out my faith more than, you know, like they were. Um, so, let's see, I was gonna tell you too about uh, St. Paul's background with them. So we started gradually doing things with them, um, going to cooking classes, um, going to brunches, and uh, we have had a, this relationship with them, I think, for a, about eight years. Um, we um, have sponsored two interfaith panels with them, uh, with people from four or five different religions talking, and we have sponsored some cooking classes, as I said. We have monthly brunches with the ladies of the Dialogue Institute. We've gone to the Turkey um, food and art festivals that they have. We've hosted baklava days here, and we've worked with them on refugee resettlement. Um, we've helped them in those service type projects, and we've had three Ramadan fast break dinners at this church, and that's what we're going to do next week. Um, so if you don't know about the Muslim approach to Ramadan, what they do is they fast for a month, and they don't eat or drink all day long, and then after the sun sets, then they get together, and it's usually with friends as well as relatives, and they break the fast together. Um, they will tell you, if you come next week, they will tell you a lot more about the way they feel about Ramadan and how it's a spiritual event for them. So I really encourage you to come next week, to step out of your comfort zone, especially if you've never met any Muslims, and see like I do that these are people that are really, really living out their faith. Um, one of the things I love about them is that they do accept all people of all cultures and all faiths, which is kind of what we hope to do at St. Paul's too. So we start at 6.30 um, next Sunday night, and we'll have a program for about an hour, and then um, at 7.30 or around there, when the sun goes down, then we will eat, and we will get to try some of their special foods, as well as we're bringing some too, so it's kind of like a potluck. And I hope that you do come and make some new friends and learn some things. Um, if you picked up the flyer, Okay, we have a flyer about this that's out in the um, entrance there, and on it there is a QR code. So we do have to have your um, your reservation by the 15th so we know how much food and how to set up the tables. So. Thanks so much. If you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, thank you, Pat. Uh, I'm grateful for Pat's leadership and um, those relationships that we get to have with Dialogue Institute. Um, and so uh, this is a way that you could seek justice on your discipleship pathway, encouraging people to get your stamp and your discipleship pathway passport out there. Uh, seeking justice is partly about learning about um, people of other cultures and growing those relationships. Um, and this might be the start of, of some new learning for you. So um, I encourage you to come, uh, but it, it's not just about that one-time event, uh, learning about Ramadan, which is a lot like Lent in some ways. 
Um, but it's a, it's a partnership that we have all year long with monthly brunches uh, with women on, on Fridays and, and part of our giving. And so uh, our, our ushers are going to come, come forward at this time, and, and I'm just grateful that we give in so many ways in our community, and part of how we do that um, is, uh, is with our financial gifts, supporting um, things like our relationship with the Dialogue Institute. So thank you all. Also at this time, kids, you guys can offer yourselves um, in your way with your presence. Uh, Kids Connection will head down with Mr. Gary uh, at this time. And um, yeah, thanks, thanks for bringing you and your whole self uh, to worship this morning. you to stand and sing the doxology with us. Oh, bless the gifts our hands have brought, and bless the work our hearts have planned. Ours is the faith, the will, the thought, the rest of God is in your hand. Would you pray with me? Good and holy God, we give you thanks for the many blessings that you've given to each one of us and for the opportunity that we have to give a part of that back to your ministry in the world. Uh, bless those who have given and those who will receive. Take what is offered and multiply it, that all may experience your glory and your grace and your joy here in our midst, uh, across our community and around the world. This we ask and pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Friends, as we continue in worship, I want to ask you to take a few moments to greet those that you're worshiping with. Uh, if you don't know somebody's name, it's okay to tell them yours and to ask them theirs. may be seated. So I want to lift up one thing uh, Pastor Eric said. Um, we are halfway through this journey of Lent, which is the, the time, the, the 40 days that leads up to Easter. And in that time, the Christian church has often been intentional about doing uh, reflection and introspection. It's an opportunity for us to, uh, to, to do assessment of our lives and our discipleship and our faith and what it means to follow Jesus. And so 
Uh, we've been doing that through a very specific lens here at St. Paul's in this season of Lent, uh, as we've been looking at our discipleship pathway. And those are uh, nine practices that help us live out what it means to be a disciple, or, or said differently, it's how we make disciples here at St. Paul's. Uh, one component of that is, uh, and Pastor Eric referenced this, is the passport, um, which is your opportunity, your, your challenge, or your invitation to, to try, um, if nothing more than to experiment with each of these nine practices uh, throughout this season and throughout the spring. And so I hope that you are uh, attempting that. Um, as we go along together. There are copies of this out in the welcome area if you haven't received one already. Um, and there are stamps out there. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, they coordinate. It's like we planned it um, with the, the various symbols. But uh, it's an opportunity for you to sort of track your progress. And there are prizes at the end, um, like salvation. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> But anyway, I just want to remind you uh, that that is available to you and encourage you to participate. If you have questions about it, feel free to ask uh, uh, Pastor Eric or myself. But um, we hope that it is a fun way, but it also pushes you uh, to, to do some of those practices that may not feel the most natural for you or, or, or where you're most inclined to go. So anyway, just want to encourage you in that work as we continue on together. As Pastor Eric said, we're looking today at small groups. And so... I want to read from Acts chapter 2 and uh, just a little bit of the context. If you remember, um, after Jesus is resurrected, he tells his disciples to go and to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. The Holy Spirit comes and we call that day Pentecost. And, and this is what happens uh, almost immediately after that. This group uh, uh, of people that was gathered in an upper room that, that had been doing a lot of life together are sort of bursting forth into the community. Uh, Peter begins preaching, uh, and, uh, and this is sort of part of the response to that. So we'll begin in chapter 2, verse 37. When the crowd heard what Peter had said, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, Peter warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to, to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. May God have blessing to our reading and understanding of these words. So our focus today is on, um, on small groups, and, and really my sermon is, is in three points. So if you're a note taker, you might want to write this down, but uh, this is the outline of where we're going, that, that we as people are made for connection, that we are intended to grow, and that we're called to follow Jesus. So that's kind of where we're going in a nutshell if you were to open your Bible to the very beginning of the Genesis story, uh, the, the, the poem that begins it uh, has two interesting features that I think are important when we consider small groups uh, that, that jump out among the others. The first one is this. Uh, when God creates humankind, uh, the text says, uh, let us make humankind in our image, as opposed to let me make humankind in my image. Now, we could debate theology uh, for a whole year and not come to clear answers about that, but Christians have traditionally read that to say two things. Number one, uh, that God and God's own self is community. Uh, we've come to call that a trinity, whether that's uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Creator, Sustainer, Redeemer. There's lots of language around that. Uh, but the fundamental, person, fundamental uh, idea is that there are three persons in God's own self, that God exists in community. And the second piece of that is that, that God creates us in God's image, and that has to be at least a part of what that is. Uh, that, that you and I are somehow wired up to need, to desire, to, to, to want community. 
That's the first feature that jumps out that I think is relevant to our conversation today. Uh, the second is this. If you read through the, the text, uh, there is this refrain that God creates and says it is good and creates and says it is good. And God creates more and says it is good. It is good. And so there is one phrase that, that sort of sticks out like a sore thumb. It's the one time in the story where God says it is not good. And that's when God looks at uh, humankind being created and said it is not good that humankind should be alone. And so God creates a partner. Both of these two things together tell us that, that from the very beginning, from our very core identity, from our deepest wiring, we're intended to be in connection with one another. I think uh, that's true. We, we experience that truth in so many ways. And, and yet, part of how we experience it is the contrast to our lived reality. So, if you look at almost any research study, uh, almost any metric, uh, almost anything that's been done in the last 20 years, it would tell you that America is among the loneliest places in the world. That despite the, the number of people that uh, uh, we have, that despite the, the relative wealth that we have and access to resources, that America, by almost any metric, is among the most lonely places in the world, and it's only gotten worse. Now, isn't that interesting? It's become true that even things that were intended to, to build us into connection have actually driven us further apart. We feel disconnected from our neighbors, like the people that actually share a street with us. We feel less connected within our own families. We, we, we see more distance even in the church, we, we feel less connected to one another. And, and, and when we try to talk about the national level, uh, many of us feel like we are, we're completely disconnected from our fellow citizens and, and sometimes even wonder what it means to share connection with them. And of course, all of that is exasperated by a, a pandemic that, that, that drove us further apart and, and in which many of us sort of forgot how to connect with other people in like real human form. Or, or we lost some of those soft skills, at least. And so America is this lonely place, and yet we're, we're, we desire connection. We, we're, we're made, we're hardwired, we're designed to be connected to other people. And so uh, various organizations, the church being one of them throughout the generations, has tried to address this gap that exists between uh, what it is that we desire and how it is that we actually live. And so I, I just want to uh, zoom in a little bit on the church. Uh, here's an interesting statistic. Again, this has been repeated over and over again through the years. If somebody new walks into our doors and attends worship on a regular basis, if they don't have uh, anywhere from six to eight people that they would call friends in the first year of their life in a community, it's actually probably a lot shorter than that, they won't, uh, the chances of them sticking around are very slim. We need to actually know people to, to connect in a community. And, and so uh, we have all kinds of ways that we, we seek after this sort of connection. In fact, uh, there are many healthy ways that we do it. But if we're not getting our needs met in healthy ways, we'll, we'll tend towards unhealthy ways uh, to meet that connection need. And sometimes good things uh, turn sour and they turn into bad ways of being in connection. Uh, but all of us are sort of craving after this. Uh, this is a fundamental part of who we are, and it's a fundamental part of our faith. And so we strive for ways to be in connection. Our chapter this week in the, in the book that, uh, that, that we had several of our clergy here at St. Paul's contribute to uh, is written by Claudia Ricks Hubbard. And she speaks um, less theologically and more from her experience of being in, in a small group of women that, that she stumbled into accidentally, uh, that she's done life with. But uh, when Pastor Eric and I sat down to interview her, I, I asked a question and I said, um, I, I play, it's, I used to play basketball every Friday night. Um, I was skinnier then. Uh, but I said, is that a small group, those guys that I gather with to play basketball with? And she said, of course it's a small group. It's a small group of human beings that get together on a regular basis. She said, but I don't think that's what we're talking about in church. When, when we say as a part of our discipleship pathway uh, that we want people to join a small group, she said, I don't think that's what we're talking about. I think there's something more because, because my basketball group is connection. But connection alone isn't enough. We're intended to grow. 
We're intended to grow in our faith. We're intended to grow in our bodies. We're intended to grow as a corporate community and as individuals. Uh, simply to be connected is a great start. And that alone would be progress for many of us, but, but we ought not stop there. We're intended to grow as well. I, I hope when you gather on Sunday mornings that at least sometimes you grow. Uh, Pastor Eric and I work, work hard to, to try to provide some context to the scriptures, to what's going on, to the, to the history of our faith and the tenets of what we believe. We also work hard to try to give you practical ways to, to live out what we read and understand in the scriptures and our faith. And that's good, and I hope all of those things help you grow. But that shouldn't be the end of it. Because uh, one thing that I highly discourage you to do from doing on Sunday mornings is to, to raise your hand and to ask questions in the middle of the sermon. <laughs> it's not because I don't want that. It's, it's because it's, it's hard to, to, to have a conversation. And, and that's the thing is, is we learn some things when we gather together. But my hunch is that every once in a while you walk out of here and say, I have no idea what he was talking about. Or I've read that scripture before, and I sure didn't think it said that. And if all we get is a one-way conversation or, or, or a conversation between uh, me and you and you and God, then, then oftentimes the growth that we intend for our faith and for our lives and who we are is stunted. And, and that's why we need to gather in smaller contexts where we can have conversation, where we can push back, where we can say, you know what, this thing really spoke to me in the service on Sunday and this thing didn't make sense. And, and we can engage in and we can begin to understand what all of this means for us as individuals we're intended not only for connection, it's good for us to see one another, but we also need to grow. And growth very much happens in conversation, going back and forth and the ability to push back and to challenge uh, so that we can begin to see things differently. Not only that, what I think we would find is that our lives and the lives of other people are also great instructors for us. That we're intended to grow by, by real life experience, not only by what we read in the scriptures, not only by the history of the faith, but by our own experiences, by our own understanding, by our own backgrounds and skill sets. And, and so when we can share those with other people and begin to mine those experiences or to make sense of things that sometimes don't make sense, we're able to grow all the more in beautiful and uh, amazing ways. When I hear somebody else's story, somebody else's struggle, I'm able to learn from what they've learned and incorporate that into my own life. And all of that can happen best in the context of dialogue and conversation. You know, I didn't write what Pat Cooper shared earlier, but I was really glad of what she shared because part of what she said, right, is that, that dialogue is a way that people build connection. Dialogue is what leads to transformation. Relationship is what leads to change in perspective. And that's true when we're talking about our Turkish Muslim neighbors. It's also true when we're talking about the people who sit in the pews next to us. That our perspective changes, that our life changes, that our knowledge and our understanding and our interaction with the world changes when we're, we're able to sit and have dialogue, conversation, to go back and forth in good and beautiful ways. It becomes instructive for us as an individual and as a community of faith. There are other things that are, that are uh, included in a recipe for growth. Vulnerability. Uh, one thing that, that Sunday morning I hope doesn't take a whole lot of, not to say it doesn't take any, but it doesn't take a whole lot of vulnerability because you're not asked to share a part of who you are. Uh, part of what leads to growth is, is when we uh, are allowing other people to, to walk alongside us in the midst of our burdens and, and we're willing to help carry somebody else through a season of difficulty. Claudia talks a lot about that in her writing for this week, about what it means to share in the joys and the struggles and, and how in a small group we're called to watch over one another in love. That's the language that I would use. Watch over one another in love to, to bear some of those burdens. By the way, um, as a church, uh, throughout church history, uh, we have grown uh, best when we're focused on, on the smallest things. And and here I'm talking not only about numerical growth, though that's a piece of it, but a growth in, in, um, in message and in the ability to, to share a witness uh, to transform the world. So 
I'll give you three examples of that. You go back uh, to, to what's happening in Acts, what we're reading right now. Uh, those early days of the church were statistically, uh, um, percentage-wise, the, the highest rate of growth in church history. Of course they were. They were right at the beginning. Uh, over 300 years, you go from Christianity being a, a small sect uh, to, to being the religion of the, the empire. Caesar converts. It's, it's incredible. But, but here's what's true about those 300 years. First of all, Christianity is illegal. So not only is it not institutionalized, uh, not centralized, it's also illegal. So it's, it's sort of underground for most of that in most areas. The second thing that's true about that is, is that because of that, Christianity grows in, in small cells, house to house. Much of the New Testament is letters that are written to small house churches, or they're, they're written to one city, but it mentions the different uh, small groups of people that gather in that city each and every day, or each and every week at least. And we have this, this vision in Acts of, of how they, uh, that they're coming together, and it says they gathered in the temple courts, and then they moved from house to house. In the early days of the church, the church grew bigger by growing smaller, by growing in small groups, in conversations. Acts sort of lays out what that looks like, and we'll dive into that in a little more detail in just a second. But a second example for you, we're here today that there is something called Methodism in Kansas in the year 2024 because of the work that John Wesley did many generations ago, mostly out of England. And John Wesley was a smart guy, but he was not the smartest guy of his day. John Wesley was a good preacher, but by his own admission, he was not the best preacher of the day. John Wesley was holy, as Pastor Eric talked about last week. He had his holy club, a great recruiting strategy for college campuses. But he wasn't the most holy. What John Wesley was better at than his contemporaries was organizing. And if you wanted to be a part of the Methodist movement, the way that you did that is that you participated in class meetings. And class meetings were uh, anywhere from 8 to 16 people. And that's where you prayed. That's where you got your primary instruction in faith. Uh, that's where you gave uh, of yourself your gifts, tithes, and offerings. Uh, that's where you supported one another. That was your community of people. And you had a, a group of, of class meetings that together made a society. And even smaller than a class meeting, you could be a part of a band. And what John Wesley would imagined was this way uh, that everyday people could engage all of their faith, that they could be leaders, that they could be listeners, that they could be learners, that they could serve. And commentators would say uh, later that because of this organization... In the United States frontier, the, the Methodist movement spread like wildfire. And it was because of the work that happened in small groups. A third example, for some of you who have been around St. Paul's for many years, it's been interesting when, when I've heard you talk about uh, the, the times of, of the most growth that we had as a community. Again, whether you want to quantify that as Sunday morning attendance or, or by the energy that is experienced or by uh, the ways that people invest in this community or by the, 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 um, how loud the mag megaphone is into the community, what, what's happened is that when you tell me about those times when St. Paul's was, was growing fastest, you also tell me about the small groups that were happening, about the disciple Bible studies that, that you uh, sort of engaged with for 36 weeks at a time. That hard work uh, about those of you who have uh, uh, students that, that, that sort of uh, you raised among peers. Uh, some of you call them your, your, your chosen family. You talk about those and, and they run in parallel with the times when this church has grown the month most. Friends, the point is this. That we're intended to grow in our faith as individuals. We're intended to grow as a body together of Christ. And that in order to do that and to fulfill what God uh, has for us in store and in mind, uh, we have to grow smaller in connection with one another while also growing bigger. And if you can't do both, you can't sustain it and it won't be healthy. And you can see this pattern repeated over and over and over again through church history. I can't think of a single revival movement that didn't center and wasn't sustained by the work of small groups. So friends, this is a part of what we're called to do. And 
It's what we see in church history. If we look at Acts, if we dive in, I just want to go quickly through uh, what might be instructive for us that when we say join a small group, uh, what do we mean by that? Uh, why can Claudia say to me that, that basketball on Friday nights is good and it's meaningful? And there's, there's nothing wrong with those connections, but it's maybe not what we imagine when we talk about this. What, what is it that we're looking for? The best way that I can think of to, to sort of... Um, quantify that is to, to look at, at this collection and acts of what the people do and say perhaps this is what small group ought to look like. And so if we just go quickly through our reading, it starts by saying they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. In other words, uh, they read this book. They grew in their faith. Uh, they engaged with the story of what God was doing and had done in the world. If we're going to have a, a small group that, that's intended to grow our discipleship, we probably need to spend some time focusing on the scriptures and what they mean in our lives. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They gathered in fellowship. That is to say that they not only shared content and information about faith, they also shared life. Like what was actually going on, uh, doing life in, the, in, in, in connection with one another. The challenges and the joys. They broke bread. As Pat said, right, it's hard to be angry at somebody if you're sharing a good meal. My guess is you've had a work function at some point in your life that you were dreading going to, and you thought to yourself, I really hope that the snacks or the drinks are good so that they can get me through this. It is a fact that a good meal or decent snacks cover a multitude of sins. The early disciples, they, they broke bread together. It says that they prayed for each other. Like actually prayed for one another. That they knew the needs of other people so that they could pray for them, so that they could hold them in that, that sacred bond of prayer that we're invited to do. That they helped each other in practical ways. Anybody who had need, they gave to one another. My, my dream, my vision for a small group would be that, that that's the place when, when somebody's sick or hurting in the hospital. This is the first group of people that show up to come visit and check in on you. That this is the first group of people that, that brings food uh, back to the house so that uh, we can make sure the rest of the family is taken care of. That, uh, that this is the people that can... Watch your kid or your dog when you have to go and attend to something important. That they, they have concern for the practical needs of one another. That's a part of the, the hallmark of, of small groups in Acts telling. The last thing it says is they, they, they witnessed. That they lived so differently in their connection with one another that, that it became attractional, invitational. That in their lives, they, they lived a different sort of story, and people wanted to know more about it, and so they made space for them. They created on-ramps and inroads uh, that people might experience the good work of God. And friends, we could do worse than using that as metrics to, to define what it means to be a part of a small group and what it looks like and, and what it is that we're aiming for. And all of those things will help us move from growth into this last piece, which is to follow Jesus. You notice there is the, the sharing of your life as a curriculum and, and the sharing of, of the, 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 the story of the apostles as a curriculum. And then there is actual practical work about meeting the needs of those who are in need around you, about praying and walking out the faith, about inviting others. Doing all of that is doing what Jesus called us to do. You notice that Jesus, while he doesn't provide us a, 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 an every week small group curriculum, he actually lives it out. The first thing he does after he gets baptized is he gathers the disciples around him. And through the rest of his ministry to the end, uh, those are the people that, that he'll be doing life with. Uh, Jesus, uh, at the very end, uh, in his prayer in John's gospel, as he's getting ready to be crucified, he doesn't pray uh, that they would get all the right doctrine. He doesn't download the most uh, important Trinitarian theology or ideas. What he prays is that, uh, that the people who follow him would be one in love towards one another. That that connection would be maintained. And perhaps the theology and the rest would figure it out, uh, figure itself out along the way. So, so small groups, I believe, are what help us move from head uh, to hands. 
uh, from idea to movement, uh, what the, the pastor, the preacher, what you hear in the, the music and the scriptures and the prayers on Sunday mornings, it's helpful to have somebody who provides accountability and interpretation, who becomes a conversation partner and helps translate all of that from head knowledge into life transformation that changes the world around us. Small groups uh, create possibilities. They generate more energy than the sum of their parts. They foster transformation. And they give us the courage and the confidence to, to move from our faith into the world. It helps reinforce the things that we need in order to go do the hard work, the countercultural work that Jesus has called us to do. Small groups become the foundation that enable to act boldly as we move in the world. So I think Acts provides us uh, an outline of what it means to, to do this work. And I want to close by saying just a few things. First of all, I struggled all week to write this sermon. And the reason I struggled is because if I'm being honest, before the, the small group that I'm a part of right now on Tuesday nights in Lent, uh, it's been a long time since I was a part of a small group. And so the reason that I struggled is because it was convicting. And there was a couple of times where I tried to maybe write around my own experience so I didn't have to hold up the mirror and be like, hey, pastor, how's that going for you? And I couldn't do it. So I say that to say that I'm right there where many of you are. This is a message for me as much as it is a message for others. I also would say that in that we need this as a community just as much as you need this as an individual. We look at the history of the church and it proves itself over and over and over again. If we're going to be a type of place that's thriving and growing, that's abounding in energy, we have to be well connected to one another. And that can't only happen on Sunday nights, Sunday mornings. So then here's my last thing. I think for most of us, at the risk of oversimplifying, we, we fall into one of two categories. The first category being that you have a small group. You hear this conversation and you say, I know who my people are. I'm clear on that. If that's you, here's my invitation and my challenge for you. Go uh, to that reading in Acts 2. Look at those criteria. Uh, learning from the apostles, breaking bread, fellowship, praying for each other, meeting practical needs and inviting others. And just do an assessment of that group of people, that small group, and ask how you're doing in that. All of us have places that we can grow in that, no matter how good your group is. And, and use that as a metric to grow what it means to do life in small group. So if you have a group, you know who your people are, how do you live more fully into that? And for most of the rest of us, if you don't, what's it look like to start that, to engage that? What's it look like to gather five, six, 10, 12 people around you to start doing that hard work, to say to somebody, you know, I want to grow in my faith. And the testament of the scriptures and our history is that the best way to do this is in connection and community with others. You don't need a, a degree to do it. Pastor Eric and I would be willing to help support you, encourage you, pray with you. But each of us needs that work, friends. We're called to be in connection. We're intended to grow. We're intended to live like Jesus does. That's the invitation for each one of us on this discipleship journey. That we would not go it alone, but rather would journey together. May it be for each one of us. Amen. One of the ways that we practice this life together. We have a rhythm of breaking bread when we're together that I think then helps us to break bread in all our homes and places, uh, groups with one another throughout the week. So uh, I'm grateful to get to come to this table each week with you all. Uh, would you pray with me? Loving God, indeed, you made us for connection, for connection with you and with one another. God, we uh, haven't always maintain that connection. We turn away from you and each other. But God, your love remains steadfast. And so in your steadfast love, you sent your son to be with us in the flesh, 
to experience everything we experience, including even death. But that wasn't the end of the story. After he gave himself on a cross to conquer sin and death, he raised him up to life and he presented him alive to the apostles for 40 days, exalted him at your right hand by your spirit sent your people, groups, to embody your love. It's by the baptism of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection that you gave birth to us, your church. You delivered us from sin and death. You made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And so in these days of Lent, when we're preparing for the yearly feast of Easter, God, we come to turn again to you. To ask that during these 40 days of Lent on this pathway, that we would be gifted in grace to reaffirm the covenant you made with us in Christ. On the night that Jesus gave himself to the end for us, God's generosity to us. Jesus took the bread and gave thanks and broke the bread and shared it with his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body. It's given for you. Do this and remember me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and raised it in blessing and shared it with his friends and said, Drink of this, all of you. This cup is my blood. Pour it out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this, and every time you drink it, remember me. So God, we do come remembering and offering ourselves once again in praise and thanksgiving made possible by, in connection with, Jesus, a holy and living sacrifice given on our behalf. God, pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and life of Christ, that we would be for the world your body. By your spirit, make us one. Reconnect us, God. Reconnect us in this meal. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at his heavenly banquet forever. We pray this by our connection through your Son, Jesus the Christ. We pray it with your Holy Spirit in connection with your whole church across time and space. And we do it, God, because all honor and glory belongs to you today and tomorrow and forever. And we pray in connection, having learned in relationship the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As our servers come forward, I'll just uh, remind you or invite you uh, that, that this is a table for all. That Jesus has grace here for you, uh, however long it's been. Uh, this is a place where you can experience grace and connection, and all means all. So um, whatever your age or stage or, or wherever you're coming from, know that um, God's love is available for you here, and, and I pray that you'll come. Uh, you can also, um, at, during this time, light a candle, if you'd like, um, as a prayer, maybe lifting up a place uh, that you want to grow a connection. Um, there'll be a gluten-free option in the back, and um, again... I'm grateful for this connection that we have as we share in this meal. there is 
his hatred let me so love and where there is darkness let me shine light and may your love cause us to open up cause us to open up our hearts may your light cause us to shine so bright that we bring hope the dark all that we do without love it means nothing grants us the courage darkness let me shine light and may your love cause us to open up cause us to open up our hearts may your light cause us to shine so bright that we bring hope So God, help us, empower us, equip us. By your love, send us. Having been filled up to give ourselves for others. In your pattern, in your way. In Jesus' name and for his sake. We give you thanks, God. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing with us our final song. together. One with the Father. One with the Father. One with the Spirit. One with the Son of God. One with our neighbors. One with our city. One family joined in.
heart with heaven. One heart with heaven. One mind connected. One body unified. Bind us together. Now and forever. Jesus be glorified. Make us one. is beautiful and life is also challenging. The good news is that God doesn't expect us to go about this journey alone. We're called for connection. We're intended to grow. We're called to follow Jesus. Go from this place to do life together, to move the world towards God's vision for it, to experience and share God's grace and God's peace. Amen. <laughs>